All right. Good morning. Sorry for that little glitch. I'm getting better at it. It was only one minute this time. <laughs> <laughs> but welcome, everyone. Look, everyone's already waiting for us. So great to see you. Uh, Jeff, good morning. How was your drive in? Good morning or good afternoon. Good evening. I know people are watching in from all over the world. Uh, the drive into the office was good. It's very windy here today in the Pacific Northwest. We're in Vancouver, British Columbia. It's uh, sort of blowing uh, 35 knots off Point, Point Atkinson. So for us, that's uh, going to make some steep waves out there. Uh, but other than that, we had a fresh snowfall in the mountains that we can see from Vancouver. So it's a pretty idyllic morning for us. So thanks, everyone, for coming and listening and sharing our passion for boat systems today. Excellent. All right. Well, let's just get started. We have our first call, MV Semi-Retired in Florida. Here's the question for Jeff. If I have 10 gauge AC wire coming into my Victron inverter, should I run bigger gauge wire on the output side because of the power assist putting out more amps? Oh, that's a good question. And uh, thanks for chiming in all the way from Florida. Um, so, okay, let's put things into context for everyone. Um, Inverter chargers uh, have this ability of doing what's called pass-through, uh, which is a term that all most inverters, practically all of them, Victron, Mastervolt, Magnum, Xantrax, uh, Outback, I'm probably forgetting some names, but all of them have this feature called pass-through. So if they see or they sense AC coming in, uh, they'll let it through on some of the loads. So even if your inverter is enabled, um, the inverter is going to say, hey, you know what, I know I'm in enabled, but really you probably don't mean that. I'm going to let current go in and go out. So inverters have inputs and outputs. Um, they're not just outputs. Some inverter onlys obviously only have an output. They take the input from the DC and then they do an output on the AC. But most inverter chargers have an AC input and also have an AC output. So the question here is a good one. Um, some inverter chargers even go further. They'll do actually what was described here as a power assist or hybrid. And so what they're saying is maybe you have 30 amps coming in on the input side, but your inverter loads are exceeding the power that are possible uh, that when you're connected to shore power. And they're going to supplement that power by actually having the batteries help out and provide more power than your shore power is now providing to your boat. Power assist hybrid. Yeah, well, you basically, when you're wiring your boat with an inverter charger that has this sort of feature, a power assist or hybrid, you'll definitely want to make sure that the output size is, is and the wire specifically, and the breakers are able to handle the maximum amperage that that device will be able to do, right? So you, it's very important, and it is possible that you might have gauge 10 on the input, it's possible, and then you might have maybe gauge 8 on the output. We normally have the input and the output be the same wire size. So remember, when we're doing wire sizing, all these tables and everything else that we're looking at, they're actually just minimum, right? It's not the target. It's saying, at the very least, do this. So sometimes for just the benefit, what we'll do is maybe we'll have an inverter charger powered by 50 amps input, and we'll have the output also, and we'll keep all the wiring both on the input and the output side to be the same. So yes, if you're gonna be outputting more than 30 amps on your output through power assist, then absolutely you should make sure that your wire size and your breakers are able to handle a larger amperage that you're gonna maybe be asking of that inverter charger. So great question, yeah. All right, so we have another one. Let's say you have a 48 volt battery bank, four times 12 volts. Mm -hmm. Does the max continuous discharge rate stay the same as the original 12 volt battery or is it added together so you can discharge higher? Mm. Oh God, I love that question. It's a tough one. Um, so when we wire batteries in series or in parallel, they have different effects, right? So in series, the voltage increases. So that's how you go from 12 to 24 to 36 to 48. So you're actually stacking the batteries, you know, positive to negative to get to 48 volts. And we, a lot of us do this for golf cart batteries. Golf cart batteries are six volts and we'll go two batteries, two six volt batteries in series to make 12 or even four golf cart batteries in series to make 24 volt. So the question might be thinking, some people might be like, oh, I don't have a 48 volt system. It doesn't apply to me. But actually a lot of us have six volt batteries to make 12 or 
two 12 batteries to make 24. So it's actually really a question about what happens when you put batteries in series. So when you're putting batteries in series, uh, the amp hours of the battery bank stays the same. So if you've got four batteries that are in series, and let's say they're 12 volt, 100 amp hours, so let's call it a group 31 battery. At 48 volts, you still have a 100 amp hour battery. So your discharge rate is gonna be the same as what it would have been for the 12 volt battery because effectively, now you have a 48 volt battery at 100 amp hours. So the C20 rating is the same. Uh, if you were putting your batteries in parallel, the voltage would not add, but the capacity would add, which would affect the discharge rate. So it really depends on how you divide and conquer. Are you going with series? where the voltage adds, but amp hours stay the same and the discharge stays the same? Or are you putting your batteries in parallel, positive to negative, negative to negative, positive to positive, and as you have a bigger and bigger bank, your discharge rate will increase because your amp hours will increase. Commonly, and this happens, and you know, there's no need to point fingers, but I get this question all the time. A lot of people think that when you add batteries, you're adding both voltage and amp hours, and you can't. That would be just a miracle you're gonna add just one. So in series, you add voltages. In parallel, you add capacity. And that's basically the rule of thumb on how you go about uh, figuring that out. By the way, before we go for the next question, some of you are joining us. If you haven't subscribed to our channel, please do so. This is what actually drives uh, Melissa and I from actually doing all of this. We love the fact that we've got a bigger audience and that we've got a good reach. So please uh, make sure that you get our uh, updated content, which is about four times a week right now. That'd be really good. So anyways, let's go to the next question, Missy. All right, Chula Vista, California. Stephen, I have a 1984 Hunter 31 with a two-cylinder Yanmar, original alternator. How do I determine if I need a new alternator? It's currently running at 2,500 RPM. Alternator is putting out 12.9 BDC. Mm. Well, that is a difficult question to answer. Um, it's sort of like how much for a new kitchen in my house? It's, 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 it's a question ha that has tons of follow-up questions. So, uh, Stephen, thanks for watching from California, by the way. Um, so, in general terms, uh, what you generally want to do is you want to have an alternator uh, that is sized to recharge your batteries in a reasonable amount of time. So that's generally the rule of how we go about thinking about sizing an alternator. If your battery bank, you know, you generally want to have at least 10%, to, you know, depending on the battery chemistry, right? Again, another question here is what's your battery chemistry? Is it flooded, AGM? Is it Firefly? Is it lithium? Those will all be factors in sizing an alternator. So those come into play. The size of the battery bank comes into play because obviously a bigger battery bank can take a bigger charge rate. So that's another variable. And then the, alter, the, the also limitations are engines have can't just run any size alternator. So different, all, different engines like yourself that you have on your boat might only be able to handle on a single V-belt up to about 90 amps at 12 volts. So uh, if you want to go with a bigger alternator, then you have to jump in into what's called a serpentine kit or a dual V-belt kit, right? So because you're driving this alternator and it needs a lot of power to be able to make a turn, so the only way to transfer power from the engine to the alternator from the crankshaft pulley is by having a wider belt, serpentine, or two V-belts. So that's another limitation. On a boat of that size, you know, I would probably shoot for single V-belt, probably a 90 amp alternator. And that should give you, by the time you derate all the factors that then come into play, you're probably gonna get about 60 amps of output, about 2,500 RPM. And also um, when you're measuring your output of your alternator, remember it's not so much about what it is, but about the change, right? No one can know what the output of your alternator is unless you talk about the change. It was this before I started my engine, it's now this. You wanna see a delta. So 12.9 should not be a, a VDC voltage for your alternator that should stay there too long because that's not really a charging voltage unless your batteries were really discharged. So if your batteries were, you know, 11.5, 11 volts before you started and now you run your engine and you're 12.9, I'm okay with that. But if your battery voltage was at 12.8, 12.7 before you started the engine or even 12.9 and you started the engine and you're still at 12.9, that tells me that your alternator might not be outputting at all or very little. And it's possible for alternators to actually fail, uh, not completely, but only output a fraction of what they should. So 
that's how I go about sizing an alternator. Pretty general answer, but unfortunately, it's pretty complicated. All right. Next question. All right, we have a comment here, Perry uh, from Prince Edward Island. Hi, Perry. Uh, I learned a lot from your talks and website. Just wanted to say thanks. That's a good one. Thank you. Another comment here from Long Beach, California. I have 17 kilowatts of uh, lithium batteries with a 2100 watt solar array running cooktop, water heater, and griddle with no issues. Wow, that's, that's a serious uh, battery bank and solar array. That sounds awesome. Uh, here's one. Uh, Jeff, I replaced my radio with a new one and I'm not able to get an automated radio check. Do you think my antenna needs to be replaced? How do you check for proper antenna performance? Mm, and that's a good one. So luckily there is a tester called the bird watt tester. Maybe I, by the way, I don't, <laughs> the disadvantages of speaking a few languages is that I mix up words sometimes, but I'm pretty sure it's called the bird watt meter. Um, what you do is you put this little tester in line between the VHF antenna and your VHF radio, and you can actually test to see if the problem is the VHF radio or the antenna. And so that's what I would recommend. They're not that expensive, you know, maybe a hundred dollars, something like that, um, around there. Um, and all our techs have them in the van. So if you don't have one or it doesn't make sense, then maybe you can get a technician to come on board and test it. But there is absolutely a tool that we use to quantify this problem. And then you'll know right away. Generally, failures for VHFs have to do with connectors. So if when in doubt, change a connector. It's 90% of all the problems that we have with VHF radios are related to the connection because that's something that we do us people. The cable could be problematic, but if it wasn't problematic before, it's doubtful that it's problem problematic now. Unless, of course, the the cable from the, or the coax cable from the VHF antenna was uh, recently uh, routed, because a lot of people forget that coaxial cable can't be um, bent. There's a certain bending radius, and sometimes the coral, as we're pulling wires on boats, sometimes uh, you get to compress um, I guess it's a little bit of a separator between the core and the shield, and that actually can really damage the antenna cable, and you have to run it again. So start with a bird watt meter, uh, get a technician, or buy one, or you know, even if you were just in doubt and you didn't want to have any of that, just start right away with just changing the connector. Getting a, it's called the Shakespeare makes a PL259, and it's a connector that you can, there's solder, solderless connections, and there's connections that can be soldered as well. Uh, definitely worth doing. All right, just a little shout out to Linda. Thanks for watching from Mass. Hi. Here we go. This question, uh, I'm going to try it, Jeff. Uh, this gentleman is from South Florida. Uh, Yamaha F250 outboard engine. Mm -hmm. What are the amp input requirements on the Victron Orion, the TR Smart 12-12-30 amp model? for an outboard. Is that kind of too technical of a question? No, no, no. Uh, so first of all, for everyone, um, there's this new device. Okay, so if everyone's like, what? What are these words meaning? All right. So it was a very specific question, so I'm going to translate. Um, so first of all, uh, here we're talking about an outboard, right? Um, but we're also bringing up a, a, a device that is re relatively new, and this device is called the DC to DC charging converter. A DC to DC charging converter is uh, generally always installed between battery to battery, and it allows one battery to recharge another battery, but not being parallel like we used to do in the past where we would just simply say combine or both on a battery switch, which is basically just having two pools of water actually be connected together, right? And that's all it is. Parallel is you're just having two things be one. These DC to DC chargers, and in this case from Victron, they're called Orion, 12 to 12 means it goes from 12 volts to 12 volts, and it's rated at 30 amps. So see, I'm still translating. Um, they're actually, <clears throat> what's great about them is they enable one battery, let's say AGM, to charge a flooded battery at a different charge profile. So instead of just saying, hey, by the way, you're having this, I'm going to have this too. It's saying, actually, I'm going to use whatever you're having, and I'm going to change it because you actually end up configuring this Orion, this DC to DC charging converter, and saying, actually, I'm, whatever, that, I'm going to use that as a fuel or as an input 
to create something completely different. And generally that is, I've, we've only ever installed the Orion between battery to battery. So your alternator or your from your engine would be connected probably to your engine battery. And then you would have the Orion and it's rate limited. So it means that maybe your other battery can take way more than 30 amps. Maybe it can take 100, but it's still the maximum throughput that you're going to get from the device is 30 amps. So there won't be a problem regardless of if you could have a 1,000 amp alternator on the engine battery, if it could take it, it could be a 10 amp alternator. It doesn't matter what the alternator is. That's between the alternator and the battery. From battery to battery, that's where you get that DC to DC charging converter. And that is going to be maxed out at 30 amps. No matter if the other battery wants 1,000 amps too, it can't have it because the maximum current going through that device is only going to be rated at 30 amps. So yes, it will work on your boat and your other battery that is not connected to the alternator will get only 30 amps of charging. And in a lot of cases, that's more than sufficient because if you've got just two batteries, let's say two group 31, 12 volt batteries, that might be just only 200 amp hours and a 200 amp hour battery bank being charged at 30 amps is really reasonable, especially if it's just a flooded battery or an AGM battery. So good question. I hope I didn't confuse too many people on that one. Well, I understand a little bit more now, so thank you. <laughs> a little shout out, Richard from Saudi Arabia. Hey, Richard, that's we amazing. We have uh, Nuno from Portugal. Wow. I know, this is great. It's awesome. Uh, Warren, this is a good question. This is a good question for Jeff. He has a 44-year-old Boston whaler. The bow light wire uh, is extremely corroded. Mm. Is there a way to wire solder? Replacing the wire in this old boat would be a nightmare. Can you force a, the corroded? Oh, yeah. Unfortunately, that sounds like a miracle, doesn't it? I have a problem and I wish it wasn't so. Yeah. <laughs> there is no solution to this problem. Uh, the solution is first start with the connections, right? So you might have hope. The connections are always the weak point on any circuit unless you the wire was badly chosen, but generally the connection. So start with the connections on either side of the circuit. What would be really interesting, what I would do as a test, and you might do as a test because I don't want to crush your dreams that it can't be done. So start with the connectors. And then here's the trick. You want to measure the voltage at the light when the light is actually turned on. So there's a big difference between, you know, sort of voltage at the light without the light being turned on and voltage with a bulb there, right? So if the bulb is there and you actually have a load, check what the voltage is at the light fixture with the circuit energized and what's the voltage um, at that circuit without a light on, even when the light turn is turned on itself. And what you're going to see is you're going to see some sort of voltage drop. And you don't want to have that voltage drop, you know, if, if your batteries are at 12.8 and your nav light is at 11.5 or 11.2 when it's turned on, that's not acceptable. Because a nav light is a safety device and you don't want to have that much voltage drop on the circuit. So in a lot of cases, you're right and it's super painful. You have to actually run a new wire. There's just no other way of doing it. Or you run a new wire to a different location. Right, we sometimes do that on sailboats. You know, there are bow lights, and then we put a tri-color light on the top of the mast. That's possible, but start with the connections and measure voltage. Quantify the pain, and if the pain is bad, then unfortunately the solution is not going to be easy. But you got to do it. That's why boats aren't easy. If it was easy, most people would do it, and not many people can. So there you go. All right, a question about bat sizing battery cables. How would you size the battery cables on the consumption or on the battery capacity? Hmm. Oh yeah, before, um, that's a good one. I got that question last week as well on one of the YouTube uh, sort of the videos that we actually posted. So when we're sizing cabling, we're not sizing them at all with in relation to the battery bank. No, we're actually sizing, it goes the other way around you actually figure out what your loads are on your boat, what they're gonna be, right? You gotta figure out, it's a little bit like, I always think about financial analogies because my mom is really good with money and she used to teach me all these life lessons when I was a kid. And you're thinking, you're like, okay, first of all, it's like, well, what am I gonna do in my retirement? What are gonna be all my expenses? So that on a boat is what are your loads? Are you gonna be wanting a lot of, you're gonna have a TV on board? Are you gonna have running an inverter a lot? Are you gonna have a lot of lights? Are you going to always want to have your chart plotter on? you got to start quantifying what your daily amp hour consumption is and 
what are the big loads, small loads. Then you actually go size a battery bank to meet those. But generally, it's sort of iterative. You're like, oh, I'm dreaming of doing everything. And you're like, oh, your battery bank is going to have to be X. You're like, oh, I can't do that. I can't afford X or I can't fit X. And so you've got to make your battery bank smaller. And then you start make, being more realistic on your loads. So it's a chicken and egg thing, right? And then you size the cabling between the batteries and your loads. The cabling is not sized at all on the battery banks. It's actually sized on the loads. So if you're going to have an inverter, for example, that's 2,000 watt, you know, that inverter might be wired over 2 watt, depending on the distance. Because remember, loads on a boat are two variables in sizing a wire. Two variables, which is really different than on land. Um, well, it's not different than on land, but on land, generally, the biggest... Uh, limitation factor is just ampacity, not voltage drop, because we start from much higher voltages, like 120, 220. And so voltage is a factor, but it isn't because we start with much higher voltages. But when on a 12 volt boat or 24 volt boat, um, voltage drop is a major, major issue. And generally, it's actually the biggest determining factor uh, if, for sizing a wire. So make sure that your size of wire will meet the voltage drop requirements and also the ampacity requirements. So two variables, voltage drop and ampacity. And generally, voltage drop is the biggest, uh, is the deciding, let's say, variable for choosing a wire size on a DC system on a boat. So there you go. Good question. Well, this is very exciting. Sergio is watching us from Italy. Hi, Sergio. He asks, what do you think about self-soldering heat shrink connectors? Hmm, self-soldering. Um, I've, I haven't used those, so don't know. So I can sort of imagine. Um, we always use in the field, and I've done this on my own boat. So this is, you know, giving you advice of, because I'm on my fourth iteration of rewiring my boat, starting my fifth one. Um, <laughs> it's sort of my little lab. I use heat shrink connectors um, that are basically completely sealed at the front of the connector uh, so that once I cut the insulation jacket off of a wire and I expose some of the wire so that I can do a mechanical crimp on that wire, once I'm done the mechanical crimp, then what I'll do is I'll apply heat to the heat shrink terminal to seal the connection. And I do that because I remember when I started my boat in about 2006, I was telling myself, you know what? The most valuable thing I have is time. Uh, I have very little money, but I have even less time. And I told myself, I want to do it right, and I want to do it once. So that's why I always use heat shrink terminals on our connections. And I, we, we're not huge proponents. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with soldering. It's just an added step. Uh, some people think it's important. Um, I've just, for me, I make a great mechanical crimp and then I apply heat to the heat shrink terminal to perfectly seal it from the environment. And that's how we do connections. And then that's relatively quick. Um, and that's how we do it. So there you go. So, yeah. All right. We have a couple of people visiting us from our last live chat. Shout out to Drew in Victoria, BC. Um, and Rick's repairs. He had a good question last time. He's got another good question. When installing a solar panel system, what size fuse needs to be in line for a 10 amp controller? Mm. Okay. So um, let's think about the big picture. You've got solar panel, start at the top, solar panel, uh, controller, battery. Um, most of the solar wiring between the panel and the solar controller is gauge 10, uh, which would allow up to 30 amps of current, which is a good thing because remember, uh, the weakest link is what causes something to fail, right? So A, first no is you got a solar panel and you got a controller and you've basically got gauge 10 wire that can handle 30 amps. Good. Then you got your controller and you got a controller that goes to the battery. You remember, we're fusing uh, the controller and the wiring uh, really to prevent nuisance tripping, right? If your solar controller is meant to output 10 amps, right, then I would probably choose the wire between the solar controller and the batteries to probably be still a gauge number 10 wire, which can handle 30 amps. And then I'd probably fuse the 
controller with a gauge 15, a gauge, maybe not gauge, a 15 amp fuse so that I never get nuisance stripping. It's important to not have a fuse be ever sized for exactly the amperage that you think might come out of that controller. Because remember, amperage is also a function of voltage. And um, you might actually have, on some days where the voltage is lower on the battery bank, you might have higher amperage coming out. And when the voltage is higher, you might have lower amperage coming out. So there's an inverse correlation between the two. So I would probably choose gauge 10 wire, which can handle 30 amps, and I would probably fuse it with 15 amps to go on a controller that is meant to output 10 amps. That's how I would do it. All right, another alternator question. If I don't know the output of my alternator, how can I check the amperage, or how mm. can I figure it out? Mm. Well, that's tough. That's tough. Um, well, you could measure, you're going to need to have some sort of clamp on meter. So there are DC multimeters that can measure amperage by not disconnecting any wires. It feels very safe um, that you just clamp on around a conductor. And then you could measure what the amperage coming out of your alternator is. So that'd be one way. Uh, but remember, alternator output is a function of multiple variables. One of is uh, the engine rotation which affects the alternator rotation. So you want to be on the top end of that alternator rotation to get a sense of what things are. And remember, a 55 amp alternator will never output 55 amps. That's sort of like marketing. Um, there's a lot of variables that come into play, including cold rated versus hot rated, internal regulator versus external regulator. The voltage output is actually measured on the alternator itself, not at the battery. So all these different factors cause alternate output to always actually be a fraction of what we buy. So again, if you have a 90 amp alternator, you might maximum with an internal regulator ever see maybe 70 amps out of that alternator. And so you'll never know exactly what that alternator rating is. Exactly, you could make assumptions and guess, but you'd have to almost bring it to an alternator shop if the etching on the plate on the alternator is gone and you have no way of knowing it's always going to be a little bit of a guess to figure out empirically what the alternator output is. Yeah. By the way, before we take another question, um, some of you, I get this question a lot as well. Some people ask Jeff, uh, what's about this about your newsletter? So we've been sending our newsletter for over almost 10 years. We send it every month and we have a link below. It's not salesy at all. It's sort of a recap of, hey, here's all the different things we talked about over the last month. And this is sort of a, a, an ensemble of videos, articles, Ask PYS, all different featured products. Again, completely non salesy And if you want to receive that in your inbox, um, please subscribe on the link below, uh, and then you'll get a little bit of PYS every month. All right, Missy, tell me. Next question. This, well, I just love this. Thank you so much for putting in where you're calling in from because we have someone uh, watching from Austria today. Oh, wow. You know, awesome. Isn't that wonderful? It's amazing. Uh, here's Good a evening. question. Why do I see breaker switches on both positive and negative leads from solar panels? Yeah. That's a good question. In an ideal world, you know, You'd probably put a breaker and a fuse on both sides of the circuit. You know, we certainly do that uh, on the AC on our boats. We have called, what are called double pull breakers. And we actually do it both on the, the hot and the neutral. And depending on what type of regulations you're dealing with, here in Canada, if it's a commercial sort of registered vessel that is going to have passengers, you're actually going to have double pull breakers on many of the circuits basically both the positive and the negative or the hot and the neutral. So it's not that there's anything wrong with it, is in most cases, we the code doesn't require that. And what they're doing in solar is they're just basically shutting off. It, this solves everything, right? Because even if you have reverse polarity, even if there's an whatever, you're literally shutting both the front door and the back door to the solar panel. So it's not that common. Uh, but it does happen. It's not crazy. It's actually an other layer. And definitely, you know, even the French, for example, on some of their boats like Jeannot, Beneteau, uh, are actually double switching batteries. They'll have a switch on the positive and a switch on the negative. So it's not that it's 
not a good idea. It's just most people don't end up doing it. Um, the only confusing part about it is that it's uncommon. And so it might leave a lot of installers or boarders sort of going, what is that and why? But the folks that came up with the idea or the implementation of this is a good one. It's just most of us don't have to do that on our boats. It's not required. Yeah. All right, Skagit. Should I replace or do I have to replace the hydraulic autopilot pump when upgrading to a new autopilot system? Hmm, okay. That is not an easy answer uh, or question to answer. It depends, to be honest. It really depends. So first of all, uh, let's put things into context for everyone. An autopilot is generally made of, let's call it three big things. Uh, control, right? So that's the interface of the autopilot. Then there's a brain. And the brain is where everything happens, like in terms of the calculations, the thinking, right? So the control is the interface. The brain is where the processing happens. And then there's a drive unit. And the drive unit in this case is a hydraulic pump. But it could also be a linear drive. It could be a rotary drive. It could be a steer by wire. There's a lot of different things that a brain of an autopilot can do. One of them is drive a hydraulic pump to move a steering fluid one way or another to affect the position of the rudders. Okay, great. All too often, um, it's, I would say hydraulic pump, if you're gonna have a problem on a hydraulic system on your boat, generally it's gonna be related to your hydraulic pump. So I would inspect the pump and visually and look for any signs of corrosion. So if it looks even slightly sort of not great and not inspiring, the challenge is if that pump fails, in a way where coolant may be, not coolant, but uh, I'm just choosing my words here, uh, this the steering, the, the hydraulic fluid is leaking, that might actually compromise the whole of your steering system. Not just the autopilot system, but steering from both all helms. It could be your lower helm, your upper helm. So when you're deciding if you're gonna do a hydraulic pump or not, I think it's 50-50. And know that, you know, to be honest, that pump is going to fail. Like, it's guaranteed going to fail. It's just a question of time. And nothing lasts forever. So if that pump has been there for five years, maybe you don't change it. Ten years? Eh, maybe not. But if it's been there for 20 years, change the pump. You know, honestly, it's going to go. And you might as well control the story and change it at your own time and at the moment of your own choosing than when you're actually using your boat and the pump fails on you. And if it fails, that it doesn't work, that's one thing. But if it fails at a fitting or a hydraulic fitting and it leaks, you lose steering. And if you lose steering on a boat, you're in a world of hurt, in a world of hurt. So that's why you know we always err on the side of caution with changing hydraulic pumps on an autopilot system. So great question. Thanks for asking. All right, this question is coming from Miami. Kind of a two-part thing about near shore cellular systems. And they watched your video uh, a few weeks ago, which I guess was the KVH LTE. Yeah. Yep. Um, and you, it's proprietary, so you have to, I think, get their own SIM. So the question is, is there a system for Nearshore Cellular that allows you to use your personal SIM card rather than a proprietary brand? Um, yes, there is. Um, I think Wave Wi-Fi might is not selling any data plans. But here's the challenge, and there are other third-party non-marine solutions out there um, that we're testing. There's nothing easy. That's the bad news. It's We're in a new sort of world of discovery. Remember, this KVH one is actually terminating the cell signal within the dome. So that's where it gets a little bit complicated is the cell signal is actually being terminated wherever the dome is. And then that cell signal is converted to effectively ethernet and propagated via ethernet into inside the boat. So yes, you're right. There are challenges with having sort of proprietary, but it's not, proprietary is not the right word. It's probably, the word is probably more like locked is the right word, um, the device is locked. Not sure how long, you know, if that's always gonna be the case. Um, but yeah, we don't have a solution right now where it's an unlocked uh, plan that is similar to the LTE. Now, most cell boosters don't have any cell 
there is no SIM card related with a cell booster. Cell boosters, it has nothing to do with a SIM card. The SIM card is in your device. So it just simply amplifies the cell signal and that would work anywhere. The KVH one is way more sophisticated because it's actually terminating the cell signal in the antenna. Like think about it. That's like literally like having your ears and your brain that process the ear signal be somewhere completely far away. You're not amplifying sound, which is what a cell signal does. You're literally processing the sound at a far away place and you're sending the resulting thing, which is what we want, data on ethernet. Um, so yeah, I know near shore cell connectivity is probably top three things or five that I get asked about. And there's just no perfect solution yet, especially if you're trying to minimize cost and have a great uh, sort of experience. It's, uh, it's not easy. It's not easy. Yeah. All right. We're going to have a question here about electric engines because okay. we're getting so many inquiries about them. Mm -hmm. um, this gentleman has uh, 85 Yanmar right now and is looking to go electric and wants... 45 kilowatts what are the options yeah well i'm not going to pretend to be an expert on sizing an electric drive um to because that's sort of and we normally to be honest we normally lean a lot on the manufacturers of the engines uh the electric propulsion engines because they're the ones that it's more of a mechanical thing even though i know it's not mechanical per se but you know, what size the propeller has to be, you know, what's the displacement of the hull, what is it going to do for hull speed? All those things are not things that um, I normally deal with with electrical systems. We are certainly doing conversions, but what I always do is I always lean back to the manufacturer of the engine, of the electric engine. And I say, okay, here's the boat, here's the existing propulsion system. I give them the inputs, we give them the displacement of the boat tell them what kind of prop is on board, right? And then we give that to them, and then they help us size an electric engine to replace that mechanical diesel engine. Once they've made a recommendation based on, you know, some of these uh, electric manufacturers have 500, 1,000, thousands of ex experiences doing that. We lean on them for that. And then once they tell us what's gonna work best for this vessel, then on our side, what we do is we start then taking stuff off the boat to actually put the electric drive in, and then we worry about the implementation. But on that one, I'm not going to pretend that I'm the only author of the story. Uh, we lean on the manufacturers quite a lot. So that's my answer, non-answer to your question. I honestly wouldn't know where to start. I would start with the manufacturers, uh, and they'll give you exactly, because a lot of them have a crazy long list of the boats they've done, and they might have done exactly your boat make and model or near your make and model of your boat. So there you go. So you were talking about the bird watt meter mm -hmm. and Drew uh, wrote in to say that it's model 43RF. So it does exist, you were right. <laughs> hey Drew, thanks for helping. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Love it, love it, love it. <laughs> You're French, you weren't making it up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, here we go, Michael. Jeff always talks inverter chargers. What about separate compo components? Inverter, charger, and transfer switch. Mm. If one fails, replace versus whole unit for repair. Easier to troubleshoot? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. The challenge is, and you're right, you know, uh, why have two important things in one device? 100% valid question. You know, an inverter uh, for some of us is something we want, but for some of us, it's something we need, right? I have boaters that run their refrigeration on an inverter. So for them, they lose their inverter. They're losing, unless they're connected to shore power and or they're running their generator, they're have, their refrigeration system can't work. So for them, they need an inverter. So you're right. Why have one device that does both something that might be important and also do the charger? The challenge is choice um, and, and, and money. So generally a really good inverter and a really good charger are gonna be almost double the price of an inverter charger that does the same thing. So from a cost perspective, you're probably gonna spend twice the money 
on the hardware alone. A really good 100 amp charger is pretty much the price of a good 100 amp inverter charger. So you're going to literally pay twice. Then you're going to have to install. It's not going to be double the install cost, but nearly double the install cost. So you're talking about literally replicating double of everything. Almost capital costs are nearly double. Installation parts and services is almost double. So now you're going to great lengths for that redundancy. Okay, sure. What I do in that case, if you're looking for redundancy, and I do that a lot, I'll actually install two inverter chargers. That's what I'm going to do. Because if you're going to go that much amount of money, you might as well spend half two inverters and two chargers. And so I install two inverter chargers and I run them in sync or in parallel. And then I also have bypass switches where I allow me to decide, okay, I, I want to isolate one versus another. It starts getting pretty custom. But, you know, we've done that on a lot of trawlers around probably 45 to 75 feet, um, where in meters would be about maybe 15 meters to 25 meters. We'll actually basically have two inverters um, for redundancy and two chargers for redundancy. And the way we do that is by installing two inverter chargers. So I agree. It's a lot of eggs in one basket. But from a cost, uh, if cost is a variable, it will literally cost you twice as much to do that. And if you're going to spend almost twice as much, well, you might as well buy two inverter chargers and then have redundancy for both. So that's an approach to this problem. There you go. Good question. I have a little shout out here from Maryland. And Rick wants to know, when are you going to answer questions from your boat? Okay. All right. Tell me, what's the question about my boat? No, from your boat. You should be on your boat. Oh, we should yeah. both be on our boats doing this remotely. Yeah, it will happen this summer. Let me tell you. I'll just put that idea out there. <laughs> I just want to let everyone know. <laughs> yes. Right now, it's sacrifice, 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 sacrifice. Work, work, work. But summer and spring will soon be here in our little part of the world. And let me tell you, I cannot wait to be on the water. So, yes, we will do this on the water for sure in the summer and the spring. It's coming. It's coming. All right, here's a question. Why does a solar panel need to be connected at the battery instead of a bus bar further away in conjunction with converter? Oh, yeah. Well, so remember, it's all about fusing the wire. That's what I worry about a lot. There's also fusing the appliance, but fusing the wire is really, really important and often overlooked. And when you think about our homes or businesses or commercial buildings, the AC panel in the building is not distributed everywhere in the building. It's not like, it's not a coincidence that all the breakers are in one location, in your apartment, in your home. It's not a coincidence. It's actually not even for convenience. It's actually the start of the circuit. The circuit comes in and then every single circuit that leaves that panel is fused and protected by circuit breakers at the start of the circuit. It's absolutely complete coincidence that it's all in one location, right? It has nothing to do for us. It's actually the start of the circuit. So it's it's a benefit for us that it is one location, but it's how it has to be. And so any connection that goes to a battery, including solar, which solar has to go to this, what's called an unswitched distribution, meaning a connection that's always on in the battery. And that could be a distribution block, right? near the battery, and that's fine. But that connection at that distribution block has to be fused. And if you don't have a DC distribution block, then it has to go directly to the battery. And that connection at the battery has to be fused because you want the whole wire from the battery to the controller and from the controller to the solar panel to be fused. And remember, your solar panel will never output more accidentally than it's rated for. There's no such thing as a failure of a 100-watt panel that goes to 200 watts. You know, if that would happen, we would all be praying for failures. Solar panels fail in partial failure or complete failure, but they never output more than what they're rated for. So if you have a 100-watt solar panel and you've sized all the wiring and the controller and everything, you're never going to have the solar panel or the controller do more output than what they're rated for. Things don't fail for better. They fail for worse, right? And so the fusing of the solar controller is really worrying about what happens if, even if the solar, this happened in the middle of the night, even if there's no sun shining, if you ever had an accidental short between two wires that are connected at a battery, and for whatever reason, the two little wires that are side by side on the controller, and I mean side by side, I'm talking like 
millimeters away from one another. If they ever touch, and they can, and you don't have a fuse on the battery, say goodbye. You're going to have a firework show on your boat. It's going to be a life event. And it might be the last boat you choose to own if you get out of it. So the reason you fuse is for your safety. And it has nothing to do with the solar output. You're actually fusing the wire in case of an accidental short, which can happen, which does happen. And it's the same thing like we do in our homes. You fuse all circuits at the start. And at the start, in this instance, is the battery. All right. This one's a little more technical, but it's related to an earlier question. All right. So let's give it a try. Let's see if we can pull it off. Can I have my alternator go directly to my 840 amp hour AGM house bank and use an Orion B2B to my starting AGM battery? Will that be more efficient to charge my house batteries? Yes, yes. Great question. Um, right, so what do we have here? Pretty common scenario. We've got an alternator and alternators generally are connected to the engine battery. How, why, how? Is there a direct connection to the engine battery? Nope. Alternators are generally connected to the starter solenoid and the starter solenoid is generally connected to a, I'm gonna use a little prop, uh, a battery switch. And then the battery switch is connected to uh, the battery. That's how it is um, in all our boats. 99.9% .9 of all boats are wired like that. Battery to battery switch to starter solenoid and starter solenoid to alternator. But there are a few issues with this sort of system. If you ever turn the battery switch off when the engine is running, your engine is probably going to be fine, but the alternator will blow up and you'll damage permanently your alternator. It's going to have to be fixed. It's like stopping a car with a wall. The car will stop, but your car won't be the same. So you can't stop a car with, well, you can stop a car with a wall, but you don't have a car afterwards. So this is why actually all of them literally say, at the bottom of the switch, they have stuff like uh, stop engine before switching to off. A little word, very sort of small here. And so it's a good idea, and I certainly did that on my boat. I actually ran, um, and I rewired the alternator, so it in involves removing some wire and adding a new one. And I ran the alternator directly to my uh, house battery bank, as you're suggesting. So that's not a crazy idea. Now remember, we have to fuse. So you're gonna have to fuse the alternator wire at the battery for a watt for a fuse that can handle both the size of the wire connected from the alternator to the battery. That makes sense, right? Um, and you don't want nuisance stripping. So if it's a 100 amp alternator, you don't choose a 100 amp fuse, maybe choose a 125 amp fuse, right? Your alternator, again, will never output more than its rated output. That's not gonna happen. That wouldn't be a failure. That'd be a miracle. There's no miracles. So you're gonna have that. And then now your battery bank of 840 amp hours, um, what you can take is you can take, how do you recharge my engine battery? Well, then you take a DC to DC charging converter, and then you interconnect the two battery banks with that device in the middle. And even if they weren't the same battery chemistry, that wouldn't matter because the Orion DC to DC battery charger would actually convert whatever input voltage comes in and would give the battery exactly what it wants on a three-stage charging. So that setup that you are suggesting is a yes and yes. Definitely a good idea and definitely recommended. So great question. And I love this question from Ian in the UK because it's happening right now in the Pacific Northwest. As I head down to the marina, all the boat covers are coming off and we're starting to clean up our boats for another season. So Ian asks, how can I test the adequacy of my batteries before the season starts? Is there a battery tester? Yeah, battery testing is a tough one. It's tough. It's, it's sort of like the way I describe it is like testing by looking at someone, how they're going to do a 100 meter dash or a marathon run and trying to extrapolate and saying, oh, I'm, I'm going to have you run just not 100 meters. I'm going to have you run 10 meters. Or instead of having you run a marathon, I'm going to have you run 10K. And based on that, I'm going to extrapolate how long you would run a marathon or a 100 meter dash. And why those two different events? Well, there's a reason. Because when you're starting your engine, that's basically like a sprinter. It's an explosive amount of energy for a short period of time. So to me, that's a sprinter. And if you think about your deep cycle batteries, your batteries that are running lights, water pumps, inverters, things that are gonna run for a long period of time, that's a marathon runner. 
So think about the two analogies. You've got a sprinter and you've got a marathon runner, right? Uh, basically a starter battery and a deep cycle battery. The good news is a starter battery is relatively easy to know how it does because the way to do that would be actually just start your engine and see what happens with the starting voltage and do it a few times, you know, start, stop, start, stop. And you're just replicating. You're actually, this is a great test because you're actually replicating what's going to happen in the real world, right? Which is starting your engine. Failing that, you could, of course, put a, uh, like they're called load testers, carbon pile load testers uh, that automotive stores would have. And you're basically just replicating the starter load. So you apply a 300 amp load for 10 seconds and you see what happens to the voltage. Now, remember, when you're testing your cranking battery, you don't want to be connected to shore power. You probably don't want to have your solar array connected. You're trying to just, you want to isolate. Remember, right? We're just trying to say, can my engine battery start the engine without a problem. The other thing too I would do is disconnect your boat from shore power, wait for 48 hours, 72 hours, a week, and then go back and see if your engine can start. Because if your engine can start with a battery without being charged for a week, that's good. And don't just start it once. Start it once, stop the engine after a minute. Wait, do it again. Try to start your engine multiple times because that might happen to us, right? Sometimes we have air in the system, right? The engine won't start for whatever reason. So make sure that you're not being a hero by just starting at once. Start multiple times and don't let the engine get too much alternator recharging. So that's how I would handle uh, testing my cranking battery. And make sure your battery switch is not onto both or combined because then you're testing both the engine battery and the house battery together to start something. You don't want that. Now, what's for deep cycle? Honestly, deep cycle batteries, there is no, in my opinion, uh, to this day, there is no way to extrapolate a short test to tell you how a battery is going to do over a long period of time. The only way to do that is called a C20 discharge test. It's pretty involved. I've got notes on my website on how to do that. And effectively, what you're doing is you're actually discharging the battery for 20 hours. And it's pretty required. You, you figure out what your total amp hours of the battery is. Again, search C20 on Pacific Yacht System. So it's pysystems.ca. The link is down below. Google uh, our search bar on my website, C20, and you'll see how to do that. It's really hard. And one, one thing I would recommend is try it out. Pretend you're on the boat for 24 hours, especially if it's a boat that you can you know live on the dock for for a weekend, even while you're cleaning it or you're doing stuff. Just disconnect from shore power. Start acting like if you were actually on the boat. There is no real way of replicating what happens in the real world in a very short period of time for deep cycle batteries. So that's why it's, it's, it's important to actually test the batteries. And if your batteries are showing you know, low voltages when you didn't expect low voltages, that might be a telltale sign that your batteries are actually aging. So great question, hard to answer, uh, but that's how I would go about doing it on my own boat. All right, we've got uh, about 10 minutes left. So I'm gonna try and burn through the rest of these questions. Uh, shout out Sailing Calypso. Cape Town, South Africa. Wow, it's amazing, what a world. Is there any issue with having oversized wires on a circuit? Absolutely not. Just other than cost and weight and space, right? So remember, oversize is probably a term for wiring that probably almost never happens to any boater ever. I mean, <laughs> the thing we're fighting against is not oversized wire, it's actually undersized wire. So remember, the tables, all these things are minimum, minimum. There's no harm in going higher. The reason we don't do it is we're trying to save cost, we're trying to save weight, and we're trying to save space in our wiring bundles. And so that's why we don't want to overshoot too much. But let me tell you, on my boat, and when I'm given a choice and my technicians ask me, Jeff, should I do a number six or number eight? I There's a rhetorical question that goes back. I'm like, you're doubting if you should do a number eight. So number eight's the minimum, or should you do number six? I'm like, always do a little bit more. Why? Again, time is the most valuable thing we have. Do it once and never think about it again. So oversizing slightly and going at least one size bigger than recommended, in some instances can make sense, especially if the gauge of the wiring is, I don't know, gauge, uh, they recommend gauge 12, and you're gonna go to gauge 10. Well, gauge 10 is bigger than gauge 12, I know it's confusing because it's the imperial system, but it's not my fault. It's just the way it is. So sorry, I don't know metric for wire sizes because I live in North America and the U.S. thinks in imperial. So I think in imperial. 
but yeah, if you're going a little bit of bigger wire size won't hurt, and it's a good idea. I certainly do it on my boat. I always side, side on a little bit of caution. Good question. All right, a Firefly battery question. Mm -hmm. uh, we are full-time cruisers, and our Firefly batteries are getting fully charged with solar all winter long, mm -hmm. but at a lower rate than they say that we should use. Are we damaging the batteries? Well, actually, uh, the short answer is no. Not unless your batteries are being discharged. So remember, uh, a Firefly battery and all lead acid batteries, the last amp in the battery can't be charged at 1,000 amp, right? It's, it's, it's basically, there's a curve, right? So you can only bulk charge a battery in bulk. The moment you get an absorption, then actually the voltage is pretty much set, and you're actually tapering down, well, the devices, doesn't matter if it's solar or battery charger, alternator, and they're actually going to be reducing and reducing and reducing the current to always make sure that the absorption voltage is not exceeded. And then it's going to go to float. So once you're in battery maintaining mode, meaning you're not actually heavily cycling the batteries, you're not going below 85% of capacity, and you're staying, as long as you're in the 90, 95%, having a 1,000 amp charger or a 10 amp charger is probably going to be the same because... You can't make use of that. Sizing a charger to a battery bank, where it comes really important is actually while it's bulk charging. That's the key. And so solar is a great way. It won't damage the batteries. You just want to make sure that when you're bulk charging your batteries, either via an alternator or a battery charger, that it's sized for Firefly a minimum of 20% of capacity. Minimum of 20%. There's no harm in going higher. You could easily do 40. We've done tons of boats with 40% of capacity as a charge rate. Um, but yeah, solar won't hurt the batteries, especially if you're just maintaining them, boat charging them. Yeah. All right. We have a good question from Germany for Jeff the Futurist. <laughs> Uh, here, uh, he's doing a ground up electrical plan, but is wondering what areas are better to put off for a year or so because of the advancements in technology. What do you see coming up? Hmm. Yeah, that's a common uh, question that I get. And I have a different sort of tact about cool and new on boats. Um, I'm I'm always a little bit more cautious than I am in my personal life. So in my personal life, I'm going to have the newest, coolest phone all the time. Because I figure if it breaks, I'll just get another one. And you know what? It's no big deal. But when I'm a boat, even having money can't solve all your problems. You could have a million in the bank. You could have way more. You could, you could, you could have unlimited funds. But there are some places where your money's no good because you're alone. And that's why we're doing We're out in the water. We're out in an anchorage. And money can't solve your problems. And you're not even able to solve your problems. So I'm always not advising people to go to new, new, new. Because I'm like, ah, you can do it, but just be aware of, of the concern. So that's my sort of general philosophy. Um, I would say right now, probably uh, the advancement that's happening, and it's pretty cool. So I don't think I would wait too long. Uh, Victron is probably the monitoring for me is really ex exciting what's happening. On, especially if you're doing a whole Victron system, is the integration of different things. Like Victron's doing really good on that. So that probably would be a play I would look at. Uh, but, you know, inverter chargers are pretty much standard. External regulators are pretty amazing. Alternators, same thing. Solar controllers are as good as I need them to be. Solar panels are, you know, I put like SP uh, solar panels on my boat, these Solbian uh, panels on my boat eight, nine years ago, they still sell them. They're still great, 23% efficiency. So I actually don't think there's any big game changers that I'm aware of uh, other than perhaps navigation systems are always changing, and that could be an argument, or communication systems always changing. Yeah, that could be it. But on the electrical side, um, you probably don't want to be necessarily the first to adopt something. You can if that's who you are, and there's some people that love that, and they're willing to live with the problems to be the first one to do anything. Uh, but I'm not seeing any big transformations that I'm aware of that you aren't aware of. So, yeah, I think just planning ahead. Things don't move as fast in the marine world as they do on land. There's just not many of us in the marine world. Businesses, for the most part, aren't thinking, oh, my God, I'm going to do something for a boat market, and it's going to change my world. They're not. It's, it's a small subset of what else is in the world. And so we're generally getting 
the benefits of other industries. So whatever, they'll do something for something else and then they'll apply it in the marine. But marine and what we do is not at the top of everyone's mind uh, on the manufacturing. RV is way bigger market. Um, and that generally uh, is what drives innovation in our space as well. Yeah. All right, we're kind of closing up here. Um, we're at the hour mark and we still have some really great questions, but I think this is gonna be our last question from Scott who is sailing the Salish Sea. Oh, locally, awesome. He says, when sizing a 12 volt battery bank for a thruster, do you calculate cold cranking amps based on the total of all the batteries in parallel, like amp hours? Yeah, so when you're actually, you're, that's a great question. And very similar, yeah, right. If you're putting two batteries in parallel, Right, so again, if you've got a 12 volt battery that's let's say group 31 battery and it's 1300 CCA and you put two of those batteries in parallel, you're act effectively gonna have a 2600 amp out, 2600 cold cranking amp battery at 12 volts. Now, if you wired those two batteries in series, you now have a 24 volt 1300 cold cranking amp battery. So if you're wiring your batteries in parallel, the cold cranking amp multiplies. And if you're wiring your batteries in series to get higher voltages, the cold cranking amp stays the same. So it really depends on if you're going from 12 or 24. All yeah. right, we've got lots of people that signed up for both the uh, newsletter and hit our subscribe button. That's awesome, thanks everyone, I really appreciate it. And I know I can't answer all the questions, honestly. I have a home life and I do have to go home sometimes. So uh, thanks for taking the time to be with me today. If you've got further questions, you can post them on uh, the YouTube comments below. And I do check those pretty much every day um, and put your questions there. Or if you've got another question, you rather put it private and you want to send it to us on our website. Uh, we do select uh, not all the questions get answered. I get over 500 questions a week. And there's no way that I could answer all of them, but we try to answer the ones that I have um, a quick answer to. If your question is super, super long, it's gonna be hard for me to answer that question. I'm just gonna be honest. Um, if I get 500 one-page emails, it would that would be my full work week. And I would do it if I wouldn't have a job because I actually love helping all of us have a better boating experience. Keep your questions as concise as possible. It might not be all the answers you're looking for, but uh, a little bit of an answer is better than no answer at all. So with that, safe boating to all of you. Thanks for being here. I love the fact that we're geeking out about my favorite topic, uh, boating systems. And thanks for watching. Thank you, everyone. Take care. See you on the water. Ciao.